Two months ago, we had a discussion about Claude playing Pokemon and how it kind of proved that agentic AI was bad. Well, some things have obviously happened since then, and I am so excited to be doing a follow-up on this story, so let's get right into it. Following the interest of Claude Plays Pokemon, there were a lot of questions. Was it really bad AI or bad design that prevented the game from being finished? Was the memory actually holding Claude back? And was the system prompt doing more harm than good? Those questions and more were quickly laid to rest thanks to one developer taking on Pokemon Blue. Gemini did it didn't just beat this Gen 1 game, it did so in style, confidently navigating routes and battling gym leaders like it had been grinding Pokemon stats in its non-existent basement for years. And no, Gemini wasn't just frantically button mashing like your younger cousin at Thanksgiving, this AI approached its Pokemon journey with the methodical calm of a seasoned grandmaster considering moves on a chessboard. But how did Gemini do it? And more importantly, why is this little achievement sending ripples through AI circles as more than just a nostalgic stunt? The answer lies in something nerdier, more nuanced, and ultimately, I think a little bit cooler. Gemini's success is a masterclass in how developers can make or break the potential of agentic AI by thoughtfully crafting the multimodal systems that power them. So before we get into the nitty gritty of Gemini's Poke Victory and the subtle but telling contrast with its intellectual cousin Claude, let's talk about why watching an AI systematically beat a decades old Game Boy game is actually a pretty big deal. Gemini's triumph wasn't the result of a single uber clever algorithm algorithm magically understanding Pokemon. It was the outcome of a carefully choreographed tango among three partners, a hefty language vision model, a Game Boy emulator, and a custom agent harness that stitched everything together in real time. Every few in-game frames, the harness took a snapshot of the screen, uh, peeked at the cartridge's RAM for hidden stats, slapped on an overlay showing Gemini where exits, trainers, and crucial pickup spots were, and then lobbed that multimodal salad at the model. Gemini's job was to convert that sensory buffet into one legal button press. Up, down, left, right, A, B. Repeat 15,000 times without rage quitting. That's the goal. It reminds me a lot of the world's first self-driving cars coming out from Carnegie Mellon's nav lab. They'd take all of these different tools and hook them up to a system that was able to make the most of them and ultimately make the first cross-country road trip hands-free in 1995. Back to Pokemon though. The magic is in the overlay bringing all of these tools together. Humans can glance at Pewter Gym and instantly know that Brock's two-person rock squad is waiting. Raw pixels don't scream Geodude is here though. Now, if you add on an extra JSON tag that says location, gym, enemy, type rock, then it certainly does scream that to an AI. By spoon-feeding these breadcrumbs, the devs turned vision into comprehension, so Gemini could think strategically instead of burning cycles on what am I looking at. Let's compare this with Claude's valiant but pixel-blind pilgrimage through Pokemon Red. Anthropic opted for maximal transparency, streaming Claude's entire chain of thought, but offering it only raw screen data and a sparse memory buffer. The result was a philosophical slowpoke that spent ages narrating its existential dread in Mount Moon while Gemini was already flashing a Cascade badge at Misty Sobbing Starmie. One of the biggest ways we saw this exemplified was through the Pokemon Center problem, where Claude struggled at times in differentiating between the red hat on the character and the red carpet that marked the exit. One model was trying to process clean text and code, the other was handed what is a pixelated mess in its own mind. Then there's the prompt engineering. Less glamorous than shiny gym badges, but ultimately more decisive. Joel, Gemini's human shepherd, crafted system prompts that nudged the model towards long-term planning. It said things like, your mission is to become champion. Think in objectives, not impulses. He also built a mini-map sub-agent that politely whispered pathfinding hints whenever Gemini started circling like a confused Pidgey. That subtle scaffolding let the AI hold higher order goals in working memory far longer than Gemini's rival. Claude, by contrast, was given strict autonomy with no sidekick modules. 
admirable in purity, but it left the model grinding outside of Viridian Forest far after the cheers had died down. This is the big make or break in Agentic AI. Proper setup of a multimodal system determines whether or not any AI agent is good at its specific task. In short, Gemini's win underscores a core lesson here. Agentic AI succeeds not by dropping an LLM into the deep end and hoping it sprouts gills, but by wrapping it in thoughtful, context-rich tooling that converts raw sensory chaos into digestible chunks of meaning. It's less about which model has the bigger brain, and more about whether the developers bothered to give that brain a decent pair of glasses and a fucking map. For big business, that's a problem, because the extra harm harnesses, models, tools, whatever we want to call it that enable agentic AI to be good, well, they're typically custom-built or modified tools that have been thoughtfully designed by a person. A lot of enterprise-level users don't want that human part of the system. It is incredibly expensive, which means success or failure of agentic AI is often up to the human investment. Getting back on track with Gemini, though, no hero's journey is complete without a few dramatic setbacks. You know, the digital equivalent of stepping on a Lego in the dark. In Gemini's case, that moment arrived in the rocket hideout elevator puzzle. If you remember our video on Claude Plays Pokemon, then you'll know that this is the puzzle that had me raging in daycare. The AI kept forgetting to sweet talk the sleepy grunt a second time to nab the lift key, leaving our pixelated protagonist doomed to pace figure forever. Except maybe not, because here's where Gemini's human partner earned his developer gym badge. Rather than hand over the solution, Joel injected a surgical prompt tweak. If you notice you haven't received an item you expected after a conversation, check whether the NPC has more to say. Suddenly, Gemini's synapses lit up, the grunt coughed up the lift key, and the run could go on. It wasn't cheating. It was the AI equivalent of handing someone a flashlight instead of trying to drag them by the wrist. Small nudges like that were sprinkled throughout the run. Never explicit walkthroughs, more like gentle taps on the shoulder. Need to teach Gemini how to swap fainted Pokemon? Well, you add a rubric in the prompt about party management priorities. Struggling with Rocket Tunnel's Eternal Darkness? Just inform Gemini that Flash is shockingly not just a superhero, but also an HM. You would maybe assume that the training data would already impart a lot of that knowledge onto the system, and you're not wrong, but these mini instructional sets help reinforce the context of the active scenario. Each micro-intervention converted hours of potential wall-hugging into confident forward momentum, showing that scaffolding can outclass brute force autonomy. Meanwhile, over in Claude Land, you could still tune into existential monologues about Zubat encounter rates, philosophically profound, I'm sure, but not exactly speedrun material. Even the runtime metrics told a story. Gemini clocked roughly 500 in-game hours before planting its flag into the Hall of Fame. Now that pace can be labeled as slug at best by speedrun standards, but warp drive compared to early LLM agents that treated every grass tile as an opponent in debate club. The difference lies in context windows and multimodal grounding. Gemini's 1 million token memory let it carry a traveling journal of every gym, rival battle, and Pokemart receipt so that late game plans could reference choices made 10 badges ago without hallucinating that Professor Oak moonlights as Giovanni. Community reaction mirrored this technical art. Viewers cheered at each gym badge like a tiny esports championship, not because they doubted if Gemini could win, but because they'd witness how thoughtful tooling transformed a fancy autocomplete tool into a persistent adventure. Reddit armchair engineers dissected prompt versions the way sommeliers analyze tannins, while Twitter showered Joel with memes of Gemini wearing Ash's iconic cap. Claude still earned love. Transparency is endearing, especially in the world of AI, but Gemini stole the spotlight by showing that when devs choreograph the dance, agentic AI can cha-cha through Kanto instead of just waltzing in place. At the end of it, it was that human element that was the make or break for both of these systems. The human in the loop, or HIDL, is something that a lot of businesses overlook. I actively watch companies say, I use HIDL, so it's okay because there's a person involved. But how many people managing how many projects with how much other work on their plate? Oftentimes, you'll find that Hiddle is an excuse to stick one person on a dozen AI projects so that if something goes wrong, a person is at fault instead of the company. 
So while Hiddle absolutely was the contributing factor that enabled Gemini's agentic AI to take down the Elite Four, it is also the exact excuse that'll ensure some companies end up kneecapping their own efforts when making AI agents. Gemini's victory in Kanto carries a moral that extends far beyond catching pixelated critters. When an AI agent pulls off something impressive, the spotlight should widen to include the stage crew. Developers who convert blurry screenshots into labeled diagrams, who give the model a diary thick enough to remember why it bought that escape rope 40 hours ago, those are the unseen trainers hurling the metaphorical pokeballs. Swap out Pokemon for customer service workflows, drug discovery pipelines, or Mars rover navigation, and the story remains the same. Agency flourishes only when systems feed in LLM the right bite-sized worldview. That sort of flips the narrative we often hear about model supremacy. Gemini didn't win because it is inherently more clever than Claude. It won because its human partner packed a Swiss army backpack loaded with pathfinding helpers, action schemas, and memory snacks. Claude's slower march shows the other side of the coin. Transparency is cool, but if you send an agent into Mount Moon with nothing but a candle and high ideals, it will spend an eternity monologuing. High performance agency, it turns out, is less just add intelligence and more layer intelligence on a scaffold that makes sense. The question isn't merely how big can we make the context window or how many GPU hours can we funnel into the next model. It's how do we design multimodal problem spaces so that the model's strengths matter and its blind spots are patched by tooling. Agentic AI is a relay race. The baton passes between perception modules, memory stores, evaluators, and the language engine. If any runner trips, the whole team face plants. Gemini crossed the finish line because its developers scripted the baton passes with the precision of a Broadway light cue. In practical terms, that is good news. You don't need a trillion parameter behemoth to build successful agents. You need thoughtful people with interfaces, disciplined prompts, and a willingness to debug when an AI tries to teach a Rattata Dragon Rage. The lesson from Gemini's trophy screen isn't LLMs can now beat every game, it's well-architectured multimodal systems can coax surprising competence out of today's models. Gemini beating Pokemon earns a well-deserved medal, but politely calls upon other developers and companies to acknowledge that agentic systems are not a magical thing. AI agents are still only as good as the people behind them, and as the world of business attempts to eliminate the human element, it is no wonder that so many of these agents fail to meet expectations. Well, folks, that's going to be it for me today. Join me next time where we'll be discussing why I quit developing my high-performance stock trading bots. See ya, nerds. <laughs>